Hey everybody, welcome back to Beyond Trek Podcast. Today we're premiering, isn't that cool, VTC, Virtual Trek Con. Say hi to everybody. Hi everybody, Chad Pack. We love hi you. Hi everyone. Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm Dag. In the house today we've got Renzo and Big J. Yo. And uh, we're going to do a little spin-up of our stuff here and it's going to be what it is because it's cool. Uh, we are talking about Lower Decks, Season 2, Episode 10, Season Finale, First First Contact. No, I did not stutter. This is your spoiler alert. I was I was really impressed with this episode. Again, like eight episodes in a row, what season gets to do that? They hit all the marks. I don't know how, how they do it. I'm honestly shocked that I even love the name for it, right? Like first first contact right like that's just a very clever play on it too yeah and it makes sense because it's the first time that cerritos has to and gets to do the first contact it's got multiple layers to it big fan mm-hmm. it was Good also it's also really nice that that first contact turned out the way that it did <laughs> Party! Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. yeah that was great but one of the best things about this episode is how it opens with just no hiding anything. You get to see this ship that's been rumored online for a week. The USS Archimedes NCC-83002. I have a feeling somebody in Mike McMahon's family was born on August 30th, 2002. Don't know who it is, uh, but that's where some of those numbers come from. But the Archimedes, can we talk about this ship for three seconds? Oh, sure. yes. Or more. It's, Thoughts? It's lovely. Like, it looks like an updated design for the Excelsior. I yep. know that Mike McMahon, in his Twitter, has explained to everyone that it is not an Excelsior class. It's an Obina class ship. It's like an Excelsior, but bigger. Mm-hmm. But that's not in the episode, so technically we can't really call it canon. Uh, we don't really know what it is. It looks like an updated Excelsior to me. And I it kind of fits the scale, too. Has anybody said Sovereign class on, on the air? In any episode, I believe it shows inside of the dedication plaque on the side of the wall. Oh well, then it might there, be in the MSD on the back of uh, the ship. Then it was uh, <laughs> wasn't this the season finale for season one when uh, Captain Freeman was at the space dock and she says something about uh, the ship going <laughs> all sovereign class on me or, or something like that. But indeed, yep, I, I like the updated Excelsior class look i i thought it, see to me it looked like it was just the nacelles that were that were different and i wouldn't think that you would change it and make it a whole different class just so, for that that's fair there's a bit more to it than that though right so it's got these right. swept back uh, pylons for the nacelles those are angled mm-hmm. they're no longer that like l-shaped bracket that the excelsiors were mm-hmm. which that's is nice right. It also has all the Enterprise B updates to the Excelsior, so it's got those like bulgy bits next to the uh, deflector dish and the extensions around the Excelsior's engines. Yep. So it's definitely like building on something that built on the Excelsior. Right? Well, it, it had those advanced impulse drives off the back of the saucer section, but the saucer section had been elongated. It yeah. wasn't a circle. It looked more like a sovereign style. Yeah, it's it's definitely a clear sign of like Starship design evolution, not revolution. It is not a new design kind of thing we've never seen. It's just an update on something we know very well. Right. And the Obina was named after the uh, the show's art director. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I was wondering cool. where that came from. Well, and they should do that. My one of the small gripes that I have about Starfleet ships, they get so cute and fancy with them like everything has to be eye candy these these different ships designs sizes you look at every other race klingon romulans pack led it's like maybe three of them boom 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 that's that's it and that's all we need it's just observer bias. We see so much more Starfleet than we see of anything else. If we had a ship mm-hmm. set in the Klingon Empire, we'd probably see a few dozen oh, more designs man, as well. That would be cool. What's a worker bee look like in the Klingon Empire? They have them in memory beta. I can show you that later. Okay. Stick around for bonus features. <laughs> so, no, so the other cool thing is the Archimedes is captain, right? So it's not oh. just a ship that's neat. We also learn who the captain was, and it's right. a certain Sonia Gomez, um, who we know well from her time on the Enterprise D. From those three episodes that she was in, one of which introduced the Borg and also introduced Captain Picard's uniform to some hot chocolate. 
<laughs> now, I thought it was it was two. I, maybe I'm missing the a third one. It's I two. knew it was. Oh well, Cal, it was two. I'm so glad that we got to see mm -hmm. her again, and they really missed an opportunity here for her being captain. And you know, who else should have been on here? That I think would have been awesome. They did Ensign Kim. No, no, no. Let let's let's give him his time as a lieutenant for a while because he hasn't been a lieutenant yet long enough. Nah. He's got to work his way up the grades. I think so, I, th I think he'd still be in soon. So Poor one guy. fun fact for us though is that okay. the second episode that uh, Sonia Gomez appears in is the Samaritan Snare. So she has experience with the Packleds from the original contact with the Packleds on the Enterprise D. So yes. if they're still afraid of like pack led misadventures when they're out doing these missions, she's a good choice. She knows what the Packleds are about. So it makes sense to have her on this frontier where the Packwoods are causing trouble still. Great to see her as a captain after 15 years after first contact, or uh, 16 years after contacting uh, the Borg. I mean, it's a pretty quick ascent, too, for a career, right? Like, remember when Data has that conversation with War? I only remember this because I watched the episode again like two days ago in Data War, where... Mm -hmm. uh, Data is asked by War, how do I get that uniform? And he goes, well, you'll spend five years at the Academy, then you'll spend four or five years as an ensign, and then ten or so years in the lieutenant grades before becoming lieutenant commander. But if she made it from ensign to captain in 15 years, that's a crazy high ascent path. Well, she you, must have gotten like a battlefield commission during the Dominion War or something. That's probably how a lot of promotions happen. I There's agree. There's a lot of military deaths. There's a lot of a lot of slots to fill. A lot of new ships coming around out of that. Same thing after Wolf Three Five Nine. You've got thirty nine thousand. I mean, on the dark side of looking at that is thirty nine thousand lives were lost, and a lot of a lot of uh, fields needed to be quickly reinforced. So you saw a lot of people in the lower grades moving up very quickly just because they were the last best expert in the field. Yep. You said uh, it was an amazing feat to go from ensign to captain in 15 years. I will laugh in Kelvin Timeline Kirk. <laughs> yeah, no, that's just the silliness <laughs> stuff. One so, day, cadet so to captain. Other goofy or other fun uh, realization here is so. Sonia Gomez has been a big part of the uh, beta timeline or the, the litverse for the last like 20 years or so. She was actually the chief engineer on the Da Vinci, which was a Starfleet Corps of Engineers ship. She literally flew around fixing engineering problems and then eventually was the captain of that ship. So she becomes oh, a captain nice. in the litverse as well as she does here. Yeah, very cool to follow up on that. So we're introduced to her under what conditions? What's going on? Well, looks like she's meeting with uh, uh, Adm the Admiral and with Captain Freeman and they're discussing uh, the transition that Captain Freeman is making to a new role on a new ship. As well She's as, getting a promotion. Uh, I think it's as also they're talking about like so Sonya's first con upcoming first contact mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sarita's playing a support role there. I'll correct yep. myself. I said uh, promotion for Captain Freeman to transfer, not like a promotion promotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it's it's an elevation in the sense that we're getting the impression she's moving to a capital ship. Right. It's an elevation of status, but not of, like, rank. Yeah. Yeah. But no, so in this mission that they're having, or this, this mission briefing that they're having with Admiral Freeman, uh, they're told that they're going to have first contact in the lab system, where there's this new beautiful M-class planet, and there's also a uh, an unstable planetoid near the sun, but nothing to really worry about. The Liparians are prob are seem pretty friendly. Uh, and the quick question comes from Captain Freeman. Why not ha just have both our ships enter orbit at the same time? And that's this great line that Sonia Gomez makes about how we don't want our first contact to be mistaken for first invasion. And that's a very good point. You don't want to show like a particularly heavy hand with a race that may not understand what you're doing. Right, right. One interesting thing about the backdrop here, there I believe they're in the Starbase talking with the Admiral, and he's got his little shelves of stuff, and it looks to me like there's a Steamrunner class sitting on the shelf. In I thought it was an Akira, but you might here? be right. It's hard to tell. They, they were close. The Akira and the Steamrunner class were... Because the Steamrunner yeah, class yeah. to me was a lot more compact, while the Akira still sort of maintained that, that constitution body build saucer body nacelles 
Um, uh, no, the seam runner is the saucer nacelles that connect to a pylon that has the overhanging deflector dish. There's no connection between the deflector dish and the, the saucer at all, direct. Well, the... It's kind of like this open hole space in the middle. Uh, I mean, it... It's hard to tell. This is a very yeah, interesting. No, I'm with you. Ship. With you on hard to tell. But. And and the audience can see it here. Uh, we've got it up in our display here. You guys can't see it, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so I thought that was really cool. I like seeing the little ship callbacks on each of yeah. these uh, captains. Tell us what you think. Is this a steam runner, an Akira, something new? Like, what are you guys seeing with your eyes? Tell us. Tell us. Yeah. I'm sure there's somebody in here who's super techie. Just genus, maybe. Who knows? Um, yeah, so they are they're celebrating for, um, Freeman's elevation here, and uh, it seems really cool. She deserves it. Very uh, fitting. Yeah. So as they're leaving this, um, they're making their way back through the starbase, and uh, they actually cross, or we actually switch perspectives to Ensign Mariner, who's just carrying a box of what looks like blue Romulan ale, Maybe. looks like Romulan ale. Runs into Jen. And literally spills a few out, and they have a little bit of a, a tiff, uh, you could say. Interesting moment like, in that tiff. Like, there's plants here, just like there used to be plants on the Enterprise D in like season one. I think they're using the plants to tell us that it's on the Starbase still. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm still I mean, okay I don't with see this. Plants on the Cerritos, yeah. No, but it still just sort of makes me feel like there's a callback to those early TNG scenes where the Enterprise really did come off as like a cruise ship. There were yep. little lounges in the intersections and stuff like that with oh, these plants yeah. there. Yeah, um, I love little couches. Space. Another cool thing about having plants on a starbase like this is if there's any like discrepancy in the air supply, these plants are helping you know to change the carbon. I'm gonna drink my drink now. No help, some. <laughs> what do you think, real plants or replicated? They're probably specially genetically engineered plants designed to produce as much oxygen as possible and to pull as much carbon as possible. Or their like phylogens they're probably... and hibernation. Right, <laughs> of, of course, because we are we are talking about Starfleet. They've got to overdo everything. It can't just be a simple plant. It, it has to be like probably some android synth synthetic plant. No, like I think of it this know. way, right? Like if you have, I think Dag's point is very salient, right? Like if you have a problem with your life support systems, right? And you have plants on the ship, they may as well be the best plants possible for that one time where they can save your life. Yeah. Okay. You just see everybody hovering around the plant. <laughs> huffing <laughs> huffing in the, the plant. plant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Beckett and uh, Jennifer s essentially spit acid at each other over this whole, like they bumped into each other. Like uh, you're going to turn me in. Don't turn me in. I yeah. not, I don't even care. Well, that kind of thing. It definitely uh, highlights. It definitely highlights like Mariner thinks way too much about Jen. Then Jen is just like, "Ugh, leave me alone." Or Jen is just using that line to piss her off, right? Like I don't even the whole, think about "I don't you. think about you." Yeah, <laughs> I don't even think about you. That's just like Mean Girl level mm, stuff. Oh yeah, that's Maybe. worse. If if you really want to burn someone, make it seem like you you don't even think about them. Like they they just don't even exist. And either way though, mean girl like, stuff. yeah. It, either way though, this whole <laughs> this whole scene is very much in character for both of them. We know they dislike each other. It's it's whatever. Um, but while uh, Mariner is picking up the rest of her little dropped Rami one or whatever, uh, the captain and Sonia Gomez walk past her, talking about like having to give some tearful goodbyes. Um, and we also hear from that same discussion that uh, Captain Freeman is not going to be allowed to transfer senior staff off the Cerritos because. Uh, Starfleet likes to keep California class crews on California class ships. That seems really odd to me from just like a Star Trek standpoint, but it does. It seems like there's always been a lot of mobility in the fleet. Like if you want to be on a ship, you can, and you're good enough, you can get to that ship. It could be a why throwaway line. It could yeah, be a, I think it's a throwaway line to suggest that this is why we've never heard about California class ships. Nobody's ever transferred onto the, uh, a capital ship from a California class ship. They don't really talk about California class ships. All we get is like, you know, for for all intents and purposes, according to lower decks now, you know, we get the privileged ships. Um, I gotta tell you, I hate the concept of calling some ships capital ships and then the California not, because if you go by McMahon's word, the California class is bigger than an Excelsior class, and we treat those as capital ships. But he wrong now, and we know why. Yeah, he is. Because mm -hmm. if you just look, if you just dodge, like, slightly, yep, right there, that it, it over. Well, scale be done. Capital, I, I 
get what you're saying. I kind of took capital ship as I don't think it's so much size. It's the role that you're playing. So it's a capital ship doesn't mean you're on a bigger ship. It's just that you do something that's a lot more robust or um, not profound, but you know what I mean? You're on like the it, cutting it edge might, of the mission parameters. Right, right. You might be on a small ship, but you're not doing, uh, you're not a paperwork ship that just goes around for second contact setting up stuff. You're probably on the fringes of space, front line. So that's how I see a capital ship. I don't know. It's one of those things where I don't think a whole class is going to be defined by a single mission set like that, right? So most ships in Starfleet are multi-mission, right? Like they can do multiple things. The Galaxy class can just ferry dignitaries. We've seen many episodes where the, where the Enterprise D just goes A to B carrying people, and that's the whole shtick. Sometimes yeah. they are pushing the boundaries. Most ships are multi-mission. Cool, cool. Uh, the Cerritos and the California class as a whole, we've been told, are generally assigned a single mission subset, right? So the engineering subset is what the Cerritos gets because it's painted yellow. The, the one with the M in the name uh, was red colored and there's a blue one that they found that was doing the research on the other thing. Like they're they're painting the, three, the, the California classes into certain boxes so maybe it's the fact that they're not multi-mission ships that's why they're not capital ships. I still don't like think that capital ship equates to multi-mission though. I think that that's like a, a bit of a break there in the logic because I don't think that a Nova class could possibly do more than one mission. An Oberth class can't do more than one mission. They're not, they're too small, they're not meant to, right? Looking so, at you, Voyager. Right, even the Intrepid <laughs> class is probably very limited in its number of like mission types. Which is Look really interesting. You, Defiant. Just to, just Absolutely. To, Defiant definitely okay. is not a multi-mission ship. Okay. It's an escort. It's, not, it's, it's, it's officially classified as an escort, but it doesn't even have an NCC designation. Like, well, that's just because it was a. That's just because it was the uh, the prototype. That's what the NX came from, right? Well, the, but even, the Sao Paulo did when they renamed that. They got, that's just because they were lazy on the budget and didn't want to reshoot all the opening scenes with an A added to the name. Are you serious? Yes. yes. Well, but why would they have yeah. to? Because it was only a few more episodes. It could have just been like. Eh. Because you have to redo the whole intro, and that's exactly the reason. It was only a few more episodes. They didn't need to waste the budget yeah, on so that. Yeah, so they just gave it the name and number back. If if you're just tuning in, Deep Space Nine did this epic ten episode finale that really did the best job, in my opinion, of tying up as many loose ends as possible for everybody yes. who participated in that show. But Renzo's right when spoiler the defiant was destroyed and replaced with the sao paulo an episode later the sao paulo they were given special dispensation to rename sao paulo the defiant and the defiant was re-registered as nx74205 yeah and um they kept it that Even way because all of the external ncc all of the external shots including the opening you know fanfare would have had to be reshot and with all those epic fight scenes from all those angles they didn't need to pay to replace the cg model because those are the first ones those are the first cg battles right there for star so, trek just to fill in the names on things because i said them before but i didn't spit out the names the merced california class was blue colored and the uh rubido and the solvang both california classes and those were red colored so they had more of a command tinted like aspect of their things but yeah so they definitely try and limit what the California class does. That's a thing. Yeah. All right, moving on before we stay here forever. I know. Well, because <laughs> yeah. we can hit that rut. We're in the Sequoia right Bay there. with our favorite shuttle and uh, three out of four of our favorite uh, main characters here. Mm -hmm. And what are they doing, Dag? What are they up to? Um, and ask him right when he's taking a, a sip of his. It's like the server at the restaurant the moment you put food in your mouth they come do, 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 do. how is everything the appropriate etiquette there is to spit your drink out and be like thanks everything good and then continue <laughs> with your soggy burger <laughs> <laughs> not an episode gag reflex big j it's, everything makes you gag man it's not an episode until i do that <laughs> But what they're doing in this scene is what Jay's background is. They are painting, or Boimler is madly painting a new Happy Freeman Day uh, in a uh, tip of the hat to Picard Day, uh, while Rutherford is having an issue with his little implant there. And uh, he, he has asks, a pop up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> pop ups. A, pop up. He needs an ad blocker. Something thing issue. In any case, the pop-up is preventing him from doing his work. He asks Boimler if he can take his shift in the uh, cetacean ops. 
Boiler says, nope, he's got to do this Happy Freeman Day like a good like a good ensign who's dedicated to his captain and crew. I thought that the Captain's Day thing was for kids. Uh, yeah. Or cabs. No. Kiss asses. <laughs> kids and kiss asses. Kids and cabs. <laughs> I don't know if you guys caught that clip from later on, but yeah, okay, good. Yeah, no, no the, the dolphin guys were great. Yeah, Matt and Kamolu. Thank you. That, that's <sighs> so funny. It, the guy's name is Matt. He's a big dolphin. Where would you get Matt as a name? But where would you find a girl named Michael? Uh, okay, all right, yeah. Hold yeah. on. Well, but no, wait a minute. But that's that is a a fitting human name. We're we're talking about uh, maybe these... Matt was an orphan and raised by humans. You don't know. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just so glad we finally first time in Amen. Trek ever Agreed. completely citation. so I, I'll go with something funny that one of them's called Matt it's it just well it don't, fits the do humor. you remember in Men in Black when they first bring Jay into the main ops area that there's two aliens who are operating like the video screens and stuff like that and yeah. Tommy Lee Jones is like hey these are the two guys they monitor all the frequencies for us this is Kiching and Jeff <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's that it's that pun if it's not directly an homage. Um but Mariner comes in to talk to Boimler here and what is she talking about? Nobody knows. Uh Mariner asks if Ransom would be willing to move up Captain Freeman Day to better line up for Freeman's promotion. She's like starting shit, basically. She's right. telling people this whole like the captain is leaving us story. Um, yeah, she starts a rumor. Yeah. So she's starting it here, and then uh, Bradward's idea. Yeah, Bradward's idea was essentially, well, let's make sure that she still gets Captain Freeman Day. Let's just move up the date. To which Mariner gets the idea, oh, I'm going to tell Ransom. I'm going to tell the senior staff. This will cause a mutiny, essentially, is what she's thinking. Yep. And it's um, so petty. It's what? Mariner. About her yeah. mom. It, I mean, it's the right. it's the perfect opportunity for her to be kind of petty about things. Yeah, yeah I just call her Petty LaBelle. Yeah, so Tendi also gets a call uh, from Dr. Ta'an to report to her office, and she worries if Ta'an is mad at her. Uh, Rutherford assures her that it's not, uh, but can't tell to be sure that Tendi hasn't left the room because of the thing blocking his vision. Yeah. Now, that was the thing that I thought was very interesting is getting that on your uh, vision screen or, or right in front of you. That was a good ad because I've always been curious to see what things look like from the eyes of data. We've seen what it looks like to uh, see through the eyes of LaForge when he had the visor and then also when he had the ocular implants. I'd like to see how data sees things like is it just a constant hud like you're in a a game or something or is it can you, you does he have a taskbar he can hide or or something i've just i've always wanted to know those things and we don't get to kinda, see we don't get to see that because then we wouldn't know how many tabs data has open in android chrome oh, 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 oh. i'm Curses sure he on runs you. a very pared down os don't you worry <laughs> but no, so anyway, our next scene is in the mess hall. We've got uh, Billups and Shax when, and Ransom just hanging out, socializing, and Mariner sits at their booth, drinks Ransom's drink, and then starts to tell them the rumor that it's going to be the issue for the next few scenes. Mm -hmm. So we get this... Oh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna, going to say Mariner and... Um, and Ransom, are they maybe close in age, possibly Academy at the same time? Because the, the way that they interact with each other is kind of like that. Annoyed. Even though there's a even though there's a big spread in rank. It's because she, Mariner's insubordinate. Okay, just because she's insubordinate. Well, yeah, I know, oh, yeah. I, mean, I know she's insubordinate. It's just, I kind of got the impression that they they 
know each other a little more beyond being on the ship. Maybe they were at the academy, you know, within the same time, even though one may have been older than the other. I'm probably overthinking. I don't think so. I don't think any of that's probable. I think the likeliest thing is maybe they fucked once after season one when they had their, like, <laughs> escape thing from that so one alien ethical. prison planet. You know, they're adults. They can do what they want. Starfleet has no right. rules against that. But True. I don't think that they've ever allowed it to become anything more than just, like, a one-time, like, way equivalent, right? And uh, Ransom certainly doesn't want it to be anything that interferes with his command stature. So, like, he is clearly annoyed by Mariner. And the reason why she is so informal with him is definitely because she is just insubordinate. Yeah. But, yeah. Two well, I think Tuvix agrees with me. Two Vicks. Can I see the doggy? Poor Bobby. No, I'm not Looking picking him up right Vicks. now. No, no, no. Oh. Maybe later. No, no two Vicks right good now. good boy. He needs to <laughs> He's learn. He's being very annoying. He needs to not. He needs to learn. Okay, so our next scene is really pretty. It mimics the whole Star Trek three when the ships leave space dock. But this emits the Cerritos and Archimedes. Very pretty, very well shot. Uh, and they both warp out to the lap system. They warp out to the lab system, but not before Freeman gets some crap from her senior staff. Oh, they've got they've and, got beef. Uh, they uh, they're not happy, and they finally warp out, and she asks for a senior staff meeting in her ready room. And Mariner just invites herself, mind you, which happens right, all the time. In you know Star she's going to do that. When uh, Cisco said to assemble the senior staff and take me out to the hollow suite. For some reason, Ezri and Nog are there. At least Ezri's a Starfleet officer. Hey, so is Nog. Was he already graduated at that point? I thought uh, he was still a cadet. It's seventh season, so he's a oh, he's no, an he's, ensign. He was, he's an ensign then. But he's not right. a senior staff. No, but, yeah. well, but, but Ezri Freeman, would be. Uh, I don't think Ezri would have been. She was. Uh, she wasn't the chief science officer. Starbase counselor. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, senior staff again is kind of one of those it, captain's choice. Yeah. Right. Well, Narrative discretion. I, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how to really define senior staff, but when you say that Esri and Nog, I'm sorry. Um, oh, my God. I. Yeah, Nog. Jeez. My brain is Jay's, just Jay fried. is suffering. I, I am. It's I'm suffering for uh, probably early onset dementia or something. Uh, I would think that Esri would qualify as the quote unquote senior staff, but you're right, Nog definitely not. Like I said, it, I think that counselor might matter if you treat your counselor the way Picard did. I don't think that Cisco ever cared for a counselor the way that Picard did, so I don't see him putting her on senior staff equivalent. But yeah, Nog is just an ensign. Yep. Kind of rough. Anyways, so the the debate that happens on the bridge is actually pretty funny. It's like. Ransom begrudgingly does her orders because it's like, if I had like, you're telling me what to do, it's nice when we all communicate this way. Then she asks Shax about repairs to the phasers and he's like if he had an update, he would tell her because communications are important amongst the crew and immediately uh, she asks Billups about it and Billups like rages at her and immediately grabs everyone and they go into her office. So. There's a little little cutscene there where Tendi walks into the hosp the sick bay to find out that Ta'ana has deleted her file. She's a little worried about this. She feels like she's going to kicked off the ship. Deleted from the medical roster and she is now doomed. Yep. Yep. So she thinks she's out, which you never want to see yourself get deleted off the roster. Even when you're a backup. Yeah. That's got to happen to that's got to happen to some of us though, right? Like you go into work and for some reason none of your access credentials work that day, right? Like you can't log into things and it's like did I get fired and nobody told oh, me? Boy. Oh, kind of moments. Man, that really happened too. I've seen yeah, I've seen that happen Ooh, too. There was boy. a mix up between IT and HR and this this dude got his um stuff cut off and so he came into the the IT guy it was like, "Hey, I can't log in and nothing's you know working doing anything." And uh course that guy's put on the spot like calls hr uh you guys say something to this guy because we mistimed this and now yeah he, he's asking what's up and um uh, that happened with me one time with the key fob like it didn't there had just been a lot of recent layoffs and coming into work put my key fob to the thingy and it didn't register and i couldn't open the door Sit. and i was just like Done. oh my god what <laughs> and then i did it again and opened but yeah 
Yeah, that Stuff happened. Like that. that happened to me as a contractor when my contract didn't get renewed, so security automatically push, put me on a deferred list. So I'm standing up there like, bzz, 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 and I have I'm like three hours early for my for actual work, so I have to wait for three hours for security office to open so that I can. Are you serious? Well, because I get there at like 6 a.m. when I had to travel to the office because I hate traffic. So well, then, I, uh, I, went okay. to, I went to a McDonald's and had like none, what, what do they call it, never-ending unlimited hash browns or something like that because their hash browns are great. And they by, do? Well, by unlimited, I mean I just went up and kept buying like five at a time for three hours. Oh, my God. That was a long time ago. I really like the hash browns. Can we get back to the episode? I also like the hash oh, browns, yes. mind you. But, okay, so... We have that little short snippet there with uh, Ta'ana. We go back to Freeman's ready room, and Freeman immediately just goes like, "What's go- what the hell's going on? Mm-hmm. And then Mariner tells what happened. Mariner heard the conversation with Sonia Gomez, and uh, she told everyone. So the senior mm-hmm. staff all start voicing their grievances. It's this whole shtick mm-hmm. that they each are pissed about. And uh, Ransom is the only one who's like, I mean, who are they going to find to replace you? Who are they going to find to replace me? Right? Like, you're, you're, I'm still going with you, right? And then uh, Freeman has to crush his soul Twice. and uh, tell him that, like, nope, just me, just me. And uh, then he thinks that he's going to become the captain next. And then she responds with, nope, they're bringing on somebody from outside, too. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Ransom looks like somebody just, like, killed his dog. Broke his heart. And then Billups <laughs> goes off again. Yeah, yeah, Billups calling oh, off is he's the last one you expect to do that. And Ransom is such a kiss ass. It really, it, it, it's come up before, but even more so now because he wants to tag along with his captain. And now not getting promoted to captain, that is kind of a burn because they just, Starfleet seems to. If they're if they're going to promote promote within the inside, like your first officer becomes a captain, if the captain transfers or whatnot, it doesn't happen all the time. But you would you would think that would I feel have like been there's more the examples route. of the opposite. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... so like let's look at the original Enterprise, right? The only time that we really saw like a replacement for Kirk was after season three in the motion picture, and they picked somebody new for the captaincy. They didn't promote anybody from on the ship. Okay, cool, cool. With the Enterprise D, we had like five or six times where somebody else was essentially in charge, and only a couple times was it Riker. I think the only time that I can think of where he was actually like given like you are now the captain was Best of Both Worlds, right? In the prime timeline. Yeah, in the yeah, and sure. even even when they got a new captain aboard, it was from outside. They got Jellico. Yep. Right. Yeah. They had Data okay. in command a couple of times. They had Jordy in command a couple of times. They had Beverly in command a couple of times. Leaving people in command is different than becoming captain. Right, right, right. right. I'm saying. not. I'm. That's why my brain yeah. is like. I'm like. Okay. Yeah. These people fall into the left in command bucket as opposed to assuming command of the ship bucket. Yes. So yeah. Um, You're right. Not a lot. But in real quick, in all fairness, for your example of the motion picture, the your top three officers from the enterprise did one got promoted one went on sabbatical uh, yeah uh, spock for colin r and dr mccoy was just mccoy's not top retired. three who's the second officer on the enterprise my man scotty well, scotty 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 yeah. should have been next up and scotty's got enough time in space he beats captain decker by far so well, but he's an and he was already a commander he was a commander by that point already you, you don't Scotty's want to stick words. him in the you don't want to stick him in the center seat. I don't think he'd want it. But um, no. He never wanted it. No, for he sure. He had the rank of captain, but he always ever wanted to be a chief engineer. Yeah, yep. but my yep. point is, <laughs> there was an opportunity there for them to, like, press gang somebody to being captain, which sure. Starfleet Command has in the past, but they didn't. Yep. So, all right. Getting back to this episode, back to First First Contact. Uh, so, we go back to the lower decks. Uh, Tendi is uh, now explaining what she saw when she was at Ta'ana's office to Rutherford, and uh, she thinks that she's done. Uh, he looks her up inside of the ship's medical database and notices that, oh, your entry is deleted. And uh, Tendi begins to cry. Rutherford comforts her and gets this idea that they should visit all their favorite places on the ship so that she'll have a proper goodbye and have all these fresh memories before she leaves somewhere else. 
and then more pop-ups. Now he's like his entire vision is covered up in pop-ups from his alerts from his implant. So he walks into a wall, and then Tendi grabs his hand, and they walk holding hands with her leading him, which was very sweet. To engineering. Yeah. Cut on I love over the to that ups again. beautiful it was ship. Funny. You guys can't see this, but the audience can see this. We get the establishing shot of the Archimedes in front of that sun right after. Oh, it was out a great board. shot too. And all the exterior shots of this episode were lovely. I'm really, really fascinated with the way that they're doing these establishing because the CG for these ships feels very much like Prodigy. Even though this show has a much more, a much different animation style, the CG is still very on point for the ships. Hey, and let's wait till we see Prodigy. I mean, you, yeah. you're not wrong. You're not wrong. It's just we haven't seen enough of it. But I'm just looking at this, and I'm like, man, can you imagine if they had this kind of CG back when, like, The Undiscovered Country came out? People would have thought this stuff was real. Uh, uh, yeah. I think Undiscovered Country holds up really well. It's it a does. beautiful movie. It absolutely does. The models are superb. I'm just You saying. want to see something whose CG doesn't hold up? Watch Babylon 5. Oh god! All right, I chat. love B five. I All love right, B five. But you know what? I, those they're redoing Babylon five, and if they're gonna yes. do if, if they're gonna do if they're gonna redo Babylon five the right way, they're gonna take all of the film scenes they did that were in internal shots, uh, or or on site location, and just four K remaster them, That's and then do doing. and then do all new graphics for all the external establishing shots, and then that would be the perfect show. No, uh, Jay Michael Straczynski's series. already said it's not a sequel series. It's a it's a new show yeah. in the same setting with different characters. It's not a oh. oh okay, so it's the same It's, it's not just... a reboot either. It's just a new story in the same universe. Okay, so oh. we're we're on the same station, Babylon five, and it's a new year and a new story and a new thing. Okay, that's cool. Yep. Alright. That's way cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, J. Michael Straczynski's like, I'm not retelling the same story. I'm not recasting these characters. So, something different. Oh, that's fantastic. Welcome to uh, Beyond Babylon podcast. This is Dag. <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> uh, but no, so, either way, there are shows whose like effects just don't hold up, right? Like, you watch an episode of Andromeda, yeah. the effects don't hold up. Undiscovered Country, Wrath of Khan, that shit looks great still. It does. They hold it real well. Yeah, even today. it's true. But without those two shows that you just talked about, like we wouldn't have gotten the experience we need to build on a lot of those no things doubt. and make them better. No disagreement there. I love both those shows, but my point is still like the effects just are kind of rough when you look back. Yeah. All right. So going back, we see the Archimedes arrive. Cool shot. Like looks really nice. Uh, and then we have Tendi and Rutherford wandering the Cerritos. They go to the warp core where they have to hide from Taana again because Taana is looking for Tendi. Uh, which is kind of terrifying when you have the crazy cat lady looking for you. Right? Oh. <laughs> she is hunting her down. You see her sniffing <laughs> and trying to find her. That's intimidating as hell. I would think that's scary. There is a Having touching a cat moment. cat lady sniffing, sniffing me out trying to find you? There's a touching moment on the Archimedes before that where the, re the fresh-faced oh. ensign trips over the, the stairs on the Archimedes bridge and Captain Gomez, you know, assures her that, you know, she's not the only person. She's she's done far more embarrassing things in front of far more intimidating captains. Totally referencing oh. spilling hot chocolate on Captain Picard. It's a great reference, because that is what you remember Sonia Gomez for. And Ordering that's something probably, from the replicator and immediately walking to Picard. Totally imagine that, that that, like, heavily influenced her career path. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. You know how I'm mortifying. Never gonna do this again. Th that, oh. Yeah, you know how mortifying that would have been to be the the one fresh on the ship and plow right into Picard, and get his uniform messed up. That's why you need to look where you're going before you just move in that direction before doing it. And it's... because I I do that, I'm a pretty sizable guy. If I just go barreling around without looking first. Somebody could get hurt, and I, I I try to consciously make sure I'm looking first because too many times I've seen you know someone walking this way, they're looking back behind them, paying no attention to, to where they're going. I mean, you could step into a. Jay's trying to tell something. us that he spilled hot chocolate on his coach once. No, I'm just saying, like, imagine being the newest person working at Amazon and walking into Jeff Bezos and spilling your coffee on him on your oh. first fucking day or something, right? Like, that's the kind of mortification this has to be. 
he owns more money than you'll ever sniff in your life, right? Like this right now he's making that money. He, so like he would right. take yeah. you he would take you put you on the first trip on the next trip on Blue Origin and then when it gets in there just eject you out of the airlock. That's what would happen. You there. That's yeah. what would happen. The card is much nicer than Jeff Bezos. You'd have a bunch of like sensors yeah. all over you like we're going to measure your sensory reactions in space and then just eject you and we'll just take those sensor readings. <laughs> so they keep traveling around inside of the Cerritos. Tendi and Rutherford keep traveling around the Cerritos. They go inside of the uh, the Jeffries tubes where they watch the Tivoli Pulsar and again Tendi cries a bit. Um... Then they talk about how everyone's advised not to get attached to their ships, but Rutherford is really clear he loves the Cerritos. Yeah. And that's a that's a nice, cool thing. It's really um, cool to see their friendship come back to fruition like this. And well, then you they can decide, get attached to a ship or, or where you work. The ship is a character in Star Trek, right? Yeah. Like yes. it's written that way in all of the show most of the shows. So it's important to treat it as such. And these characters clearly love their ship. Yeah, Cerritos is our friend. Yeah. So their their last little discussion here is that they should go to an area that's off limits that they've never been to before. So they're just going to sneak off to it. And that seems like a cool idea. Where would you guys think is, you know, completely off limits on a starship for active members of its crew? Uh, senior Probably staff the... mess. Okay. Well, senior okay. staff mess, that's a good guess. The, the armory where they keep all the weapons? Mm, I don't know. Baby Bear seems like he's got the run of the security operation stuff. What about uh, baby wherever baby. they store the torpedoes? Possibly, okay. maybe? A captain's ready room? Captain's ready room, definitely. Not not place you can just wander Do not into loiter room. in the captain's ready room. <laughs> Unless you're Mariner. A Mariner has access to it, apparently. Uh, right. Yeah, well... Well, and why? Because, mm, of course. Mom. But let's right, talk yeah. for... Let's, I know we're, we're delineating again, but let's talk for two seconds about Mariner's relationship with her mom that gets her that privilege there this season. Last season... She was the nuisance. This season, she's working with her mom. They're getting along pretty well. They're having their back and forths, and this episode kicks off a back. And we get to, you know, why we're on this back before we can move forward again. Well, and yes, you're right, we do. And Mariner has been established as a character that she doesn't she, she thinks she's a, a kirk-esque kind of rogue character oh they literally have that discussion later in the episode yeah, we, we get yeah. there in like 10 minutes yeah we'll we'll get there sorry i, I jumped oh, ahead but so that's good. just her attitude it, it, it's that she doesn't care she's not trying to get promoted this is where she wants to be so she's just at some point she stopped giving a shit mm-hmm. she's brazen brazen oh yeah so we cut back to Freeman's ready room, and uh, you know the senior staff are still Fuming. complaining uh, vociferously to their captain. Freeman says that their complaints are noted and is like ready to dismiss the whole thing. Um, but Freeman takes Mariner aside and furiously tells her that she can't do this kind of thing, right? Like more with more fury with Mariner than she had towards Rance or any of her other crew, because she's a mom. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Uh, but before they're able to get any deeper into this like personal argument, a red alert starts blaring. Yeah, but I also think that like as a captain, she's allowed to dress down an ensign who went way outside their their ballpark, and to to specifically to cause dissent on the ship. Like yeah, no disagreement at all. That's you're not just my daughter, but you went so far over the line here. I think there is still a boundary that that Freeman has with her daughter and she's, she's only going to go so far. And then, then it's, you're being, you're beyond insubordinate right now. It's just rude and disrespectful. So yeah. And, and also I am your mother. Yeah. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. No, it was perfect. I thought it was a very realistic scene for like motherhood where you're having a conflict with your kid. Like it, it makes sense. Like, it shows, though, that Mariner is also hurt by this whole thing, right? Like, she didn't even tell me she was leaving. Like, I'm her daughter. If I have a new yeah. captain, what's going to happen to me? And this goes oh, back to Mariner's, right. uh, Mariner's abandonment, abandonment issues. issues. Yeah. yeah. For sure. I like how we totally just said the same thing at the same time. <laughs> like, <yes. laughs> Guys, this happens a lot more often than we like to admit. Yeah, we only, you only get to see one hour at a time, but, like, 
you know, the three of us are twins. Right? Triplets? Whatever. Triplets. All the right, three so, of us are twins. <laughs> so, red alert. When red alert's a big deal, so yep. they run back outside. Everybody immediately starts back to work. There's no more bitching and moaning at that point. They go back outside, and uh, Boymore reports that the Lapirian sun has emitted a, um, a huge solar flare, and it's going straight for the unstable planetoid. Uh, and that sounds like bad news, because then we see what happens a moment later yep. with beautiful effects. Uh, the flare blows up that planetoid, and it explodes in this massive wave. It reminds us of... It should remind us of three other times that we've seen an Excelsior class in, in a similar wave. In Undiscovered Country, we see the Excelsior caught in the Praxis explosion wave. Yep. In uh, Generations, we see the Enterprise B in the Nexus, again being slammed by purple energy waves. Right. And in the Voyager episode Flashback, I think is the name of it, we also see the ship being hit in that nebula with a yes. wave of purple energy. So what is it with Excelsior class of just getting, getting hammered by blast waves? And I want to talk about what happened to the uh, to the, the ship planetoid? Oh, okay. uh, in this scene well, and not not the planetoid but to the ship um why didn't they raise why didn't um they raise the shields why didn't their they shields were up the, they were up okay we see it hit we see things bouncing off the shields but uh think of it as like an emp which is what the character describes it as it ends up frying their computers so you yeah. can only hold that back for so long right Right. Yeah. Imagine, like if, would... imagine if Praxis had been like in the same system as the Enterprise or the Excelsior when it blew up, right? Like that Ooh, would have been rough, right? Yeah. The Excelsior was on Federation side of territory, light years away, and it still shook the shit out of the Excelsior. Well, so and this was, and the, was visible and everything. This was the perfect Chekhov's gun. Also, there's this unstable planetoid in the region. Um, that <laughs> that's just gonna be fine. No one's gonna care no, about that. Yeah, Dag, there hasn't been a Chekhov cameo in this show yet. That's not till next season. <laughs> He'll shoot his gun in that episode. Chekhov didn't even yeah. shoot his gun in the episode in which he had a gun. Isn't it great? <laughs> For those of you oh, the that, irony. that don't know. But he does fire torpedoes at that rock inside of motion picture. Yeah. With a trigger. Belay which was awesome. that phaser order. You All right, so cutting, <laughs> cutting back to the episode, uh, the Archimedes gets hit by the plasma wave, their warp core is offline, their power backup's all offline. Yeah. They've got nothing, right? And they realize that the ship is drifting back towards the planet, uh, and an ensign on the bridge like asks the question, like, why are we still moving? Uh, inertia, because uh, space. Nothing's there to stop you until you hit the planet. Yeah. So... Sonia Gomez is very much the whole like, well, everyone get to work. We can fix this. Very up, like, optimistic Starfleet attitude towards it. There's no like time for for despair and dismay. It's just get to work. So I like the toppling <sighs> end over end that the the ship was doing. The tumble, just, yeah, yeah, tumbling, tumbling towards the towards the planet. You know, and I don't really, know why I like that. I just did. They're really lucky that, that cool. they only got caught in two vectors of of inertia they could have been caught in three and oh been my God. tumbling like end over end around <laughs> end over side to side you know that would have I, just at that been point i'd have terrible. to just be like turn off the view screen i i can't i can't look at this i'm also, gonna be sick just i'm just what? noting here that everything on the ship is offline but gravity still works internal comms uh, uh, we know why gravity still works they maintain a charge and and What's the life third support? thing? Life support. Okay, so what's the fourth thing? The view screen? The thing that doesn't the thing that, that stops you from becoming tomato paste against the wall when the ship oh, inertial, inertial dampers. Damp inertial dampers. Dampers, yeah. Those are the that's the big thing for me. Yeah, yeah. So but those are all space magic, it's fine. Basically the the things that are absolutely required to still work somehow still work. Did we ever see their ship's comms actually work? Yeah, she mm. she 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 does a hail from the bridge, telling everybody to get to the back of the ship. Oh, that's true. She does try that, but that I, was after they've been doing some repairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know if it actually, in retrospect, I don't know if she's actually talking to everybody on the ship or just telling the or bridge just crew. the bridge. Yeah, mm. ambiguous. Well, uh, it was yeah, it was everyone, and honestly, that's 
that was not going to work. No, no, obviously not. But there's a better all. chance there than not. But no, so like the grab plating, we've we've heard that all the way since Enterprise, right? It maintains a charge even if the ship loses all power. Yeah. So it'll hold you on the ground for like hours and hours, probably mm-hmm. longer by the 24th border of the 25th century. Uh, inertial dampeners, you know, if anything's still going to have emergency power, it should be that, right? Yeah, Ooh. yeah. But yeah, you're right. Actually. The otherwise should be orange paste. Orange and paste. There's a great line there where they talk about the situation that they're in, and the captain's like, all right, I'm acknowledging this. Also, that's enough existential dread for the day. Let's get to work. I like that. That was just well, a yeah. really cool, like, meta on what would have normally been a commercial break. Just, <laughs> captain, we're screwed. And everybody just stares <laughs> ominously as the music rises to crescendo and then goes to the end. And the red shirts turn around and go, why Why are they just staring at the view screen like that? What's going on? <laughs> so we've got a great next scene where it's the Cerritos' bridge crew like realizing what happened to the Archimedes. Uh, and that they they actually state there are 20 hours until it crashes into the planet, and the impact itself is going to be devastating, catastrophic damage to the planet. Makes sense. You drop a warp core on a planet, not good. Uh, so or Freeman originally asked about the, using the tractor beam, but Cerritos can't get close enough. These are the isotopes inside of the debris field. Okay. Uh, then they ask about like flying through. Uh, Ransom responds, no, if even something as small as a pomegranate hits the shields, their systems would be going down the same way as the Archimedes' was. Uh, Boimler notes that if they try to put up their shields while going through it, it will attract shit at them anyways. So all their bad ideas are getting thrown out. Um, Kayshawn then proposes going around the thing by using warp, which, you know, we don't really hear why that's a bad idea. <laughs> but everybody but thinks it's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, everybody seems very clear that's a bad idea, but it doesn't go sound like a bad it. idea to me. Yeah, go around it. Why was... Okay, go over so... It. If you want why me to theory a... craft the why, maybe the explosion had some sort of sus- subspace effect. So going to warp See, now might cause more damage than good. That would have been an interesting take, because my brain went there too. I was like, what happened? Because they said that energy draws that plasma to them. If they went to warp, they should have said something like, it'll create an isolytic tear. And then everybody knows what an isolytic tear is. That's bad. Can't because go to warp. Direction. Yeah. Right. Very bad. Well, why would they have to go to warp? You would think that the impulse, because this wave is not traveling faster than the speed of light. No, but they only Impulse have 20 hours. Of light either. Huh? They only Impulse have 20 hours. Of light. Uh, right, right. How do you guys talk at the same time twice in a row? You first. I think, I think you two are joined, like joined at the brain. I would have thought that with uh, under impulse speed, they could have got around it. But again, they don't say why that's a bad idea, just that it's a bad idea. The narrative drive prevents it. Yeah the impulse doesn't go that fast right like it can't go faster it can't go speed of light right and i expect that that wave is propagating at either speed of light if not slightly faster because it seems to have had some subspace effects anyways well we know praxis's wave was going faster than light there's definitely a lot of very interesting things about the speed of whatever happens here happens like Mm -hmm. the solar flare goes off if a solar flare went off in on on the sun right now it'd take eight and a half minutes for us to know Yes. And if it was somehow, you know, if it somehow that energy of that solar flare went to blowing up uh, a planetoid between us and there, it would use some of that solar energy trying to propel these suddenly massive rocks, which would then, you know, have to interact with the ship at some point. And so there's just a lot of, of, uh, a lot of, imagination being taken with the speed of Suspend this your reaction. Yeah. Right, exactly. It, yeah. it is because you don't have the debris heading towards the planet Well, let me at help. the speed of light. Let me help. Instead of it presuming that the planetoid is near Earth, presume it's closer to Mercury's orbit, right? So mm-hmm. it's only 16 seconds from the sun at that point, right? It's yeah. much closer, right, at light speed. Uh, cool. At that point, when it explodes, the planetoid itself is made up of something that is space magic radiolytic isotopes are part of the planet itself right when it explodes it sets off an explosion that is faster than light itself right Uh same way like a a dilithium bomb would have effects on subspace right same kind of concepts so it blows up there now as to why the planet isn't affected by it the chunks themselves are terrifying when they hit energy sources but there's no energy source in the planet's atmosphere the planet's atmosphere just gets them really really hot and they melt the, the chunks themselves aren't that large. Pomegranate-sized, maybe bus-sized, that all burns up in an atmosphere. 
So okay. the planet's mostly fine from the debris. The real fear is the warp core on that Excelsior, or sorry, Obina class, about to impact mm -hmm. the planet's surface. Squeak, 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 lady. <laughs> it's sorry. the two yeah, bricks. So, so there's my uh, little attempt to yeah. rationalize it for you. Let's move forward. There's big bad, yes. and we gotta fix it, and we get a whole lot of troubleshooting, and not even Mariner can figure this out for the captain like she did uh, when there was a big savey moment the last time this happened. Yeah, so, Mariner has no notes on this one. Got nothing. Yep. So Freeman Which is, good. is Freeman leaves the bridge. Mariner runs after her. They go to the captain's yacht where Teddy and Rutherford have to hide because they're they're in that place that they're not supposed to be. That wasn't the armory or the ready room or the, even the captain, the senior mess. And Freeman so is ready to take the ship out. This is the most we've seen of a captain's yacht besides Insurrection in all of Star Trek. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> yes. We, we, we know that the Enterprise-D had the Calypso. We know that Voyager uh -huh. had the Aero Shuttle and that Nova class and have a Wave Runner. We know that these things are essentially captain shuttles, but the only one we've ever seen was the Cousteau, which was Picard's on the Enterprise E. We see it for like a couple minutes in, in Insurrection. That's it. Yep. Here we see the Freeman's one, and we don't even know its name, but it's nice to know that even a California class gets a captain's yacht. But we don't see it on the bottom of the hull, which is interesting. You're right, we don't, because we see the one on the uh, Galaxy class on the Enterprise D. Mm -hmm. we, we see that we see the and yep. why didn't i i remember there was some kind of story or reason why in voyager okay so you created the delta flyer what about the freaking captain's yacht that was already there under the supposedly it was never finished like they they left space dock without it in complete status so it's there is essentially just like a placeholder yeah. but as far as being able to see it so the nova class which you can see right here See that mm -hmm. little triangle above my shoulder on the yeah. saucer? That's the Nova class's captain's yacht equivalent, which is called a Wave Rider shuttle. So, okay. like, sorry, but yeah. Oh, so, it's your doggy. That's all right. You know, he's he's having being, fun with he's his toy. with his toys, you know. But yeah, so Pupper's there. Uh, but yeah, so we finally get to see some of the captain's yacht, which is neat, and we see that uh, Freeman is trying to take the shuttle out and try and go save the Archimedes alone, and Freeman, or sorry, and Mariner's trying to be like, don't be crazy, I'll fly it, you haven't flown anything in like a decade, and the mom is like, I was the hyper scoop champion when I was in the academy, and it's like, yes, that's a very Picard thing to say, but you're still dumb for trying to do this on your own. How many times did Picard mention that he won the Academy Marathon, or did somebody mention that he won the Academy Marathon? It was all the time. It was always the Academy Marathon. It, it kind of reminded me of Al Bundy and the six touchdowns in one game kind of thing. If you've seen Married with Children, that was always his bragging point, was at six touchdowns in one game. And with these guys, kind of the same thing. It, it's... Did, do you do anything in Starfleet besides run marathons? Why couldn't they have thrown in something from Parisi Squares or, I don't know, anything else? It's like all they do is run. So here's where we get that great scene where Mariner describes herself as just being like a rogue like James T. Kirk, right? And Freeman says that you're not as confident as him. You need to let your guard down. You need to drop your defenses. And that's when Rutherford and Tendi barge in and are like, hold on that's an idea let's drop our defenses and go through the through the through the debris cloud um that's where he argues that they need to remove all of the armor from the ship and the inner hull will protect them and uh that's their plan that they're going to try which is something novel we've never seen in star trek the closest right. i can think of is the nx01 enterprise had to drop a couple plates of their external hull when in they had field. romulan mines attached to it yeah. which was neat I want to share just one observation about uh, inside the shuttle. Uh, when Mariner's arguing and it's pointing at her, there's an MSD of the shuttle and it has the name cut off at the top. It says Shuttlecraft something. And I can't read the rest of it because the letters, you know, there's enough to be able to say, okay, that says Shuttlecraft. And then the next scene, it does say Shuttlecraft there, but I can't see what the rest of the word is. Quick, somebody message Mike McMahon and ask him the name of it. Ah. Uh, Let's do it. Good idea. I I thought that was a very novel idea. To I didn't. I never thought of the whole the outer hull being like that, actual removable in case of emergency Plating. components. 
I like the fact that the, the display for that is the same shape as the engineering table in TNG. It's pretty cool. I love the fact that it has a double hull at all, right? Like, in most depictions of Starfleet ships taking combat damage, that you don't see the difference because there, there's no real need to show it. But here, by actually removing the combat armor, which they don't need, it, it's very clear what the purpose of that outer hull is for. It's yep. just a blade of armor defenses. It's there to block a disruptor bolt or a phaser beam. Or as the inner hull. Or it's, and it's also there for warp travel. Sure. It's it's yeah. everything. It's it's probably radiation hardened as well, right? Like to block out harmful rays. However, you don't need it if you're only going to lose it for a couple hours to go save a planet. So they start shedding it. This is actually the same way some submarines in the real world work too, right? Like Russian nuclear submarines all have double hulls. The outer hull is just a pressure vessel. Then the inner hull is what maintains atmosphere and such. And they can actually have water filled in between the two. Oh, I did not know that. That's, that's interesting. raising and removing ballast, isn't it? Yeah, they use it for ballast as well. Okay, wow. Time American to... subs don't do it. It's not necessary. We we just use one like one hull with both layers to it, but they have an actual space in between the two. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now now I know. And knowing is half the battle. More you hey, know. you want more military facts? Just sign up to my uh, newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So going back to the crew, they run they run this plan by Billups who confirms that, you know, the ship can take the beating. The plan could work. They have to just get every single officer to start work on it now because it requires a th everybody in the crew stripping things off because it's so much work. Right now, right away, even you poor ballroom dancers. <laughs> oh, yeah, the they postpone the competition. <laughs> yeah, but they get everybody, and they make the, the cool captain speech to, you know, rouse everybody to action because we're Starfleet. Everybody's up, everybody's in uniform, everybody's out. Spacewalking all over the, sh the ship. Now, I'm sure that it was for just being able to see, have a, a, a cool scene. And I know they did it in Enterprise, doing it now. But I would think that the controls to e eject part of the, the whole plating would be inside the ship and wouldn't require jump through all these hoops to do let's, let's think it through right like how many times is the ship going to need to generally remove a part of its outer hull that way right the only times you can think of at least for me are things like repairs in a space dock or repairs after like combat right where right. the hull plating itself has been damaged heavily right and in neither one of those does it really matter if it's from outside or inside you know Mm. I I wouldn't want any of those things to be able to be removed by voice command or touchpad. Oh, I, yeah. Imagine I, if somebody not... gets the computer to do it, right? Like somebody hacks the ship's computer on the inside and there's like it ablate all hull armor or something, right? That, but that like, won't do it because they have the the, the big turn knob. That's what I'm saying they... is, you know, I, I when you would ask, you know, why do they have to go outside to do this? The, the reason they have to go outside and do this is because you can't take a nail out without getting a hammer in there and pulling. You have to be able to, you know, sure, really, okay. you have to really want to take the plating off this ship. Gotcha. Okay. You know, it's like, it's, uh, it's like trying to eject your warp core, right? There's, there's a reason you can't do it from your, from the, you can't from do it from room. anywhere. You can it only do it from works. the bridge. Well, you can do it from the bridge, you can do it from engineering, but you can't do it from anywhere else, right? Right. There's probably a good reason why you might want to do it from somewhere else, but you can't because it's a big fucking deal. Right. So don't do it. And the reason that the, the reason the warp core can be a button press is because the whole plating isn't going to explode and kill everybody. The warp core, <laughs> you're going to need a, somebody's authorization to get that thing to go and go now before the ship is in danger. So there's a reason. Whereas hull plating was being removed by ensigns and lieutenants across the ship. Right, right. Yeah. Doing the little first contact, pull, twist, buttons, twist back, eject. That's a really cool confirmation there, but you're you're basically confirming to the ship that we're removing the nails on this vitally essential component that probably isn't going to explode. I never thought of it that way. Like, removing the nail, you're right. You've got to do that from the outside of where the nail is and not from the inside. It's a matter of barrier of entry, right? If you make yeah. everything too easy, it is easier to make a mistake, right. right? So by making there be a big hurdle there, it makes it less likely that this gets done willy-nilly. So yeah. they don't. And I, I'm, I, I, I would have thought the hurdle would have been the, the whole pulling the thing, twisting it, pushing it back in. But yeah. See, and I'm thinking about like 
the Enterprise D saucer reattachment, there were pylons that inter- interlocked with the two modules. It wasn't just like oh. maglev. Right. Hey, Big J, here's another take for you, right? Remember okay. at the very end of the episode when they have to release the one last plate and they have to do it from the inside, not the outside? Yeah. It was a plate that had a control panel on the inside and the outside. Maybe every plate on the ship has a control panel on the inside and the outside. It's just faster to go from outside control to outside control than from inside control to inside control. Okay, because when you're when you're out on the hull, it's more or less you're able to go as the crow yeah. flies, whereas inside the ship, you've got to go gotta... from Jeffrey's tube to the bedroom to that access panel <laughs> through that guy's bedroom over, etc. Right? I think yeah. that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Very good. Cool. All right. So they start stripping the ship, uh, or rather, they agree that they're going to start stripping the ship. But uh, Billups realizes that Rutherford is having issues with his vision because he's kind of having a bad time. And uh, he explains that he can't see properly because of these pop-ups because his implant's memory has actually run out. Uh, And he doesn't want to wipe it because he's been making backups of all of his memories that he has with Tendi because in case something happens to him again, he doesn't want to forget these things. He's been doing three backups. Yeah. Right. And Billups advises that... uh, he should live his live his life, make new memories, right? Um, I want to point out that Rutherford's triple redundancy there reflects Chief O'Brien's triple redundancy from uh, that one episode of Deep Space Nine where the Cardassians were there. I forget what that was called, but they basically reopened the wormhole and there was Tricor's third prophecy and all that stuff. But she was surprised, like, why do you have triple redundancy? And Miles was like, that's standard for Starfleet. Now, here's my gripe. Here's my IT guy gripe. One, there's nothing wrong with triple redundancy. Okay, that's that's great. But not all in the same place. I agree. It would not make sense to have your, your original and your two backups or whatever on the same hard drive. Because at that point, you're, you're really not doing anything. If you're really serious about redundancy, then you have the original on your computer, you have a thumb drive with another, and really, to be perfectly honest with you, you're doing a cloud backup. So I would think that if this stuff was so important to him, of, of course, naturally, you wouldn't keep all these these copies because he's worried about losing it. Well. Yeah. You're, you're going to lose it. I totally agree. It's, That's why I have 3,000 pads, one with an MP3 each. <laughs> so I'm right there with you, Big J. I completely agree. Um, the smarter thing to do would be what Arium was doing, right? Deposit memories into, like, the ship's computer. Uh, yeah. Then you have a copy in your brain and then a copy in your implant, right? That's three copies. So mm-hmm. I think that that's a much wiser way. Maybe uh, Rutherford, as an ensign, though, doesn't have access to that much storage on the ship's computer. Well, I, th- that, that's something that... But I'm with you, though. Hey, having ca- hey so- Captain, can yeah. I save my memories on the on the hard drive here? There's plenty of space. Or just ask Billups. Billups will definitely tell him yes. He's his friend. He's his friend. Right. But, but you're telling me that there's, there's no external media on the ship to be able to do a backup. And I get it. Mm-hmm. It's part of the plot. But All I need to kill a it just It just bothers me when I see I'm stuff like that because... You know, I I work in that. There is nothing more crazy than, and I used to used to work for an MSP, and there are so many stories about. Well, do you have do you have any backups of, of this? So like, yeah, it was on the same hard drive that died. Oh my god, really? So our next scene is this neat scene where everybody's like, it reminds me a lot of in Nemesis when they're prepping for battle. Right, yeah. where they put up the shield around the, the, the warp core. They all start stocking up with rifles. Here, it's the opposite, though. It's move all the volatile materials into the core of the ship. Uh, they remove the ship's view screen. They start moving patients around. Like, you see people being moved in bio beds. Like, it is a cool scene where they are literally just prepping for everything that can go wrong, might go wrong here, which mm-hmm. is neat. Tell me again, uh, why do they remove the, the view screen? Because it's going to be off. Yeah, you can't see anything. We're going to remove the view screen so to have... Yeah, so you can actually see. Way. And the inside gotcha. of the bridge gets pummeled. All the little rocks and micrometeoroid things. Yeah, it's pretty that's, wild. Yeah, that seemed kind of freaking dangerous to me. So we go back to the Archimedes, mm-hmm. and we're trying to jumpstart a shuttle, and it doesn't work. The shuttle is named the Adonis, which is nice, because that's a reference to Archimedes himself. 
So and that's fun. Who mourns for Adonis? Mm -hmm. Good call. Cool. So they've got seven hours left, and uh, Gomez is talking about how they or she will give it her all until the last second. Very Starfleet. Her exo tries to talk her into go taking a nap, get some sleep. Uh, <laughs> She's like, we'll be Gomez getting plenty of rest with, in seven hours anyway. <laughs> and then the exo catches on that that's a joke, and, and so forth and so on. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see what you did there. So we get a really neat scene after that of the Cerritos losing more of its armor, still shedding chunks of things. We see uh, parts of the warp nacelles coming off. The pylon, like the pylons, are all exposed. The warp coils themselves are showing. Very pretty stuff all over. And uh, Ellipse is stuck on a plate. Ellipse can't get one to release. It's fused, so they have to release it from the inside. Mm -hmm. Uh. But if they're going to make it to the Archimedes in time, they have to start moving now, which means they've only got a limited amount of time to get the plate to come off because one plate will attract meteoroids from the radiolytic field right. and uh, it'll ruin their entire attempt. So right. they're in a I kinda, rush. I kind of thought that the exposed nacelles would be a, a problem. No? Mm -mm. Yeah. Not with the power off. Because yeah, everything's they, already turned off. They, they turn everything off and they go to manual helm for you know thrusters only or... RCS stuff. only even it's it's actually it's actually a really cool scene when we see uh, ransom piloting and we see the RCS reaction mm -hmm. thrusters popping yeah. off really yep. really nice yeah one oh, of the yeah, things that was that was from a, a TNG episode the one I always want to say yeah, it was Samaritan snare no I think I always want to say that one because it sounds like it would have been the title for that episode but it's not they're in that asteroid field that they, they can't get out of another ship was was stuck and oh they I all died on there the Promelian battle cruiser one yeah yeah that's and, and booby trap the card booby trap yeah okay yeah booby trap and they're doing the the thruster thing there's something yeah, so, of that there's something I just noticed about this scene where Billups catches the Bajoran before she flies off into space and brings her back down and then realizes that this panel isn't going to come off if you look at this they're on the underside of the saucer it's upside down. I didn't notice that the first two times I watched this. And I'm looking at it and I'm just like, those nacelles are going the, oh. oh yeah. Oh, I They're upside too. down on the saucer, just like in First Contact. And yeah. I they think, do a good job of showing us where they are during these scenes. Yeah. I think another thing that wouldn't happen is that when you're, when you're running, there is a point where neither foot has contact with the ground. Even even if it's a the smallest moment, so w would he really be able to? Yes, inertia. Run in the. Of course, inertia. Remember, well, if the magnet on the thing doesn't require contact, right? Right. And you're still moving, so mm -hmm. unless he's jumping out into space, he's still going to land right back on the ship. So there there is an amount of space that the the boot going to be magnet magnetic enough of course to keep you beta testing you back quality there, assurance would have seen to that okay yeah QT. i was just kind of thinking about that part can you really run that fast in those things and not i think the expanse does a better job of showing how magnetic boots would really work right okay. like they actually turn off when they're like lifted off the ground right but in starfleet or in star trek in general they don't seem to turn off when you let go so they may not even be completely magnetic. They may be even gravitic boots, right? Like they may use more than just magnets to keep you pinned. But yeah, I mean, it could be strong magnet. Right? Yeah, it could just be magnetic, but it could be more. We don't even know. It's never really been explored. Gotcha. Ultra neodymium. In fact, they even call them grav boots sometimes, right? So maybe yeah. they are gravitic boots or gravity boots. They generate. They attach you to something with gravity rather than with magnets. Yeah, Star Trek Six. They had gravity boots. That's how it was described. I love the heads-up display that Ransom gets. It definitely feels taken right out of Into Darkness. Yep, but the joystick feels right out of Insurrection oh, again. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I also feel like this is, like, an artistic achievement for the the graphics team, just to, like, we're going to strip off this CG model that you built, so now you have, the, you have to show us the wireframe underneath, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, graphics part was probably hating that idea that the oh, writers wrote for that. Oh, but it turned out so beautiful though, right? Mm -hmm. Like, seeing the coils inside of the nacelles, seeing all the copper under everything, like, the whole thing just looks sick. I was mm -hmm. very impressed with the artistic achievement of this episode. I hope it gets awards for it. And so, Rutherford can't see anymore, so he has to delete his backup memory. Again, you know, if you'd had off-site backup, 
but no. Not a had a not allowed to have cloud backup. Not allowed. <laughs> Like Let's on a submarine, point, though, you're not right? allowed to have internet service, so I mean, that makes yeah. sense. Let's get to the point, though, right? He deletes his memory, and he gets a memory that he doesn't think he was supposed to see, yeah. which is of a couple of people talking over him in shadows about how they've implanted a fake memory into his subconscious that'll make him think that the procedure was elective. And then it cuts. I like Two that cetacean setup. ops. And I love the cetacean ops room because they have... They have floaties and little rubber balls and buckets of fish and rocks just hanging out. Wait, what do you think of that scene, though? What do you think that that means, though, Dag? Don't move us away from that so quickly. Is this Section 31? Is this Klingon intelligence? Like, what is going on here with that? What are you hiding? I was so trying to not have to talk about this. Okay, so that admiral that arrested uh, Freeman at the end, he's the voice of the guy who's talking over in the, uh, in the memory that's uncovered. Yes. Oh, oh. You knew that already. You <laughs> I, I don't didn't... side eye me in that attitude. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted you to say it, so I didn't have to. <laughs> ah, well, there you go. So, home fry admiral or or captain You're our guy. You're correspondent. So. Yeah, he's definitely uh, in on these shenanigans. Um, I'm glad we finally got to see Cetacean Ops. It's yeah, been mentioned. Hey, yeah know, it's such a cool thing. I'm geeking out because the emblem of Cetacean Ops on the floor is like a killer whale flowing into the ocean thing. It. And it's derived a lot from the Cetacean Institute of Star Trek IV. So Which I makes love sense. that. I love it so much. I bet you so that the, uh, the doctor from there was the one who led the whole creation of Cetacean Ops as a, as yeah. a thing. So Jillian, just uh, headcanon, Jillian Taylor is the uh, the founder in chief of Cetacean Ops. And really, honestly, she was only 30 then, so she could be like 130 now. Oh my gosh. Get her back as like, well, yes, I founded it. <laughs> just like a, like a 130 year old Dr. McCoy showing up on the Enterprise oh, D. God. It'd be great to see. <laughs> well, Jillian she spent Taylor. the first 30 years in the 20th century, so who knows what kind of damage the pollutants there did to her. Yeah. She might not have been able to make it to 130. We can fix all of True. that at Star Trek. Okay, so with so, Citation Ops, it, it, is it safe for me to assume that that's not on every ship? Well, it was on the Enterprise D, and it's on a California class, and they yeah. are responsible for navigation as it's canon now, which had only been theorized before that the reason they have cetaceans on there is because they ha can, you know, help navigate the ship. So here, it's true. So yeah. maybe every ship has a cetacean ops. Also, just How? a point to make for us, right? We don't know if the two officers that were in Sedation Ops are actually dolphins. They might be alien races that just kind of passingly look like them. We have no reason right. to assume otherwise yet. Um, we do know their names are Matt and Kamolu, which is cool. Yeah, um, there's Cetacean Ops. I love yeah. that they were in uniform. <laughs> I love their uniforms, man. And their science uniforms, too, which is interesting because navigators are usually command. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so can someone tell me this? How how does this department help with navigation when you're they in think in 3d uh, uh, remember uh, if you're an aquatic species you move in 3d natively we right. as a terrestrial one move in 2d natively so maybe they help with planning or plotting routes in 3d okay all right so in sci-fi there's a bunch of thing there's a there's a bunch of like movies and games and books that have mentioned like cetate like cetacean species or <laughs> aquatic species being great at this. My favorite example of it is in a game called Sword of the Stars where they have a, a dolphin race called the Lure, right? Mm -hmm. And their their shtick is literally, we think natively in three dimensions, you come from a planet, everything for you is flat. We can dive down deeper and that's just part of our behavior. So they are just better at maneuvering. And uh, I think that that's kind of what the approach is for this. Gotcha, okay. But yeah, the fact that they finally showed it is great because they've mentioned it since yesterday's Enterprise. Wow, that was in your space enterprise. I'm gonna have to go back and watch that. Yep, it's in the subtitles even. So okay. we need us. We need to hit this button down at the bottom of the cetacean tub, and Mariner's jumping for joy. She's gonna do it, and everybody else like, no, you need to go talk to your mom and sort this out because she's gonna be up there freaking out. And if you can't like calm her down, we could put the ship in danger. You go. Boimler's got this. Mariner accepts in sort of an argumentative way, but finally heads off. And Boimler dons the hero mode again, 
as we've discussed in this, like, this is like the seventh time out of ten episodes that Boimler has mm-hmm. saved the day. He is the man. Boimler is the man. I think we all underestimated his character and what we what he was going to be in this series, and oh. we've been proven wrong. It's okay. The future, One fun, the future yeah. thinks Boimler is the laziest, you know, most disorganized crew member in in Federation history, right? Yeah. yeah. One fun thing to cover here is the personality that Matt and Kamalu have is pretty cool. They are very horny. Yeah. Like they want Rutherford to jump in and just get all uh, sweaty with them and like go, go skinny dipping. Like everything is a bit twisted for them, which is fine. Everybody can yeah. have their kinks. That's cool for sure. them. Um, I just think it's a funny play on the whole uh, meme that dolphins are essentially rape monsters, which is fair. Oh, right. But right. they're not. They're not. We don't even know what they are. They could be bad. beluga whales. They could be dolphins. They could be whatever. But yeah, that's the joke that they're playing on, which I think is pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, but there's one funny scene here that we skipped over, or bit that we skipped over here. Somebody asks. Why can't the two cetaceans just go push the button? And they start screaming at them in like squeaks and whale song and flip using their flippers because they don't have hands, which I thought was pretty funny. Because, yeah, they're like the, the displays down there were, weren't designed for flippers. Okay, so if, it, <clears throat> if this location wasn't designed for them to be able to get to, then why the hell is it? In a spot that's underwater, that's an extension of cetacean ops. Because on what mission is somebody going to have to go down there to release that panel that isn't going to be in a starbase or a you know a ship a starship repair facility? I just still I and again think it's kind of silly. It had an external option, but the external thing was fused. So here is the like they were lucky that it wasn't behind somebody's dresser, like like fourteen feet of uranium in front of it or something, right? Right. They could right. just get to it. They just didn't have the time to do it properly. So no breathing apparatus, no nothing, or you mm-hmm. know, just in a rush. There's got to be a trope for this, like oh, the thing we need is in the worst possible place to get it. Let's fine. Oh, okay. I just. I kind of answered my own question. It's it's because the the mechanism to remove the plating, you're right. They're going to be in very inconvenient places. You have to be able to get to them, but that means that there's not a lot of picking and choosing as to where that is on the inside part. Okay. All right. Yep, that's exactly it. And we already saw it. They tried it from the external side, and the outside one was, was fused. Yeah. So... Okay, so our next scene is just literally Boymore swimming down the tube, pushing himself between things, fighting with the access control, fighting with the pull thing the same way uh, Worf does in First Contact, eventually triumphing, pulling it out, and realizing that his suit has a tear. Just like Worf. Oh. Yeah, and he's slowly oh. starting to fill with water. Y- yeah, so the the obstacles that he had to had to swim around was that what, what, why was that there that wasn't part of the, what was in the hallway didn't that get <laughs> that's, that's the galaxy quest thing was... who put these chompers here whoever wrote these ep- this episode sucks I, I wouldn't even say there was that much there right like it's like there's a ladder and there's like some things you had to squeeze through it's not that bad you know I've my... seen much messier offices honestly again the only time that this was expected to be used was in maintenance that pool was probably drained Oh, you know, there's yeah. probably like a connecting quarters tubes for cetacean officers and they're off duty. And that tube's probably drained when it's in maintenance. It's really easy to just climb down, unhinge it, and you're not working against time either. You don't have an ionic plasma storm and a ship that's about to destroy a planet that you got to get down there real quick to do the thing. True. <sighs> okay. Man, you guys are rocking it on all this stuff that I think is ridiculous. We're, like, we're just coming up with good rationalizations. Yeah. Smacking them down. Smacking yeah, them down. The audience is, is wild today. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. we get to the scene on the bridge. Uh, Mariner arrives at the bridge. Uh, Ransom is still navigating. Uh, Mariner immediately runs up to her mom, hugs her, apologizes. We get a nice tender scene. Freeman apologizes. She was being a bit of a jerk. Uh, and... Mariner volunteers to help with navigating, like spotting debris and such, and she takes the opposite side of Jen, um, the opposite side of the hole where the view screen used to be, and they're just like spotting things out there, seeing what they can spot, yep. literally. 
they get this nice moment where they both look at each other, Jen and uh, Beckett, and just like nod, like we can do this, which is good. That's building. Uh, so that's a nice scene too. Yep. Boimler passes out trying to get to the surface. We got no idea what happens. Cerritos is going through the uh, crazy, crazy field of, of crazy here. And it looks beautiful. Again, the lighting, the graphics, they're all just super well done. I really hope this episode is nominated for, you know... Uh, graphics. Yeah, graphics awards for sure. That'd be great. That'd be really great. Jump back to Cetacean Ops, and Matt and Camolo bring Boimler to the surface. His blowhole's broken. Did y'all catch that? Mm-hmm. Or the what? His, his blowhole's broken. His blowhole's broken. broken. He ain't breathing. <laughs> uh, uh, but Tendi's was... in medical, and she knows what to do. Mm-hmm. There was one small little thing I, I just thought of because we keep talking about the manual flying of the ship through the debris field. And I thought this when I first watched it and I went back to the scene just to confirm. So Ransom is sitting in his chair, not the captain's chair. Mm-hmm. If you're flying in manual, why wouldn't you sit in the chair that's directly head on instead of at that angle he would be at even though it's not much of an angle, why would he stay in his chair and not the captain's chair? Because the captain's chair is true center, the, his is not. The display is interactive and can calibrate for ship perspective for him. Yeah, the HUD adjusts for him. Well, but why make it harder on yourself? Because you're visually, you're looking out through the view screen and you're looking out through an angle, but your HUD is like, it's it just seems it just seems silly. They that didn't want to take the captain out of her chair. That uh, might be the real answer, but like honestly, like when I'm playing Star Trek Bridge Crew, I'm not actually on the bridge of a starship, but the display is calibrated such that I am positioned. Uh, oh, that's fair it's too. It's easy to be. Big J, you've seen those three D TVs, right? The newer ones that let you actually see three D from multiple angles. Yeah. Maybe it's the same kind of thing, right? The the HUD on his on his helmet just covers it so you can't even tell that there's an angle that you're looking at from it just okay. masks the angle for you or something but even then i agree with you he the smarter choice would be to do it from the captain's chair if the captain's chair also has a manual steering thing if mm-hmm. we don't know um it would be smarter but really rule of cool here let the guy sit in his chair let the captain be in her chair and so on so on captain probably had her own joystick honestly <laughs> but she's yeah, not a good pilot, everybody. As, as Mariner pointed out many times. Right. But yeah, so in Ugh. this scene, I actually loved how we could actually see the RCS thrusters firing the four different directions independently. It was very interactive. You could see the ship like twisting as it did things. Yeah. Very well done. And it was really cool to have the camera be uh, locked to the ship perspective so that when it did that, the whole universe spun. You're still seeing the saucer section where it is, and the outside just... It was very Justin. Battlestar Galactica, like, uh, oh, fighter yeah. cam kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Really liked it. Like, like the that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, don't do that all the time. Do that for things that are appropriate, but it was nice. Yep. Cool. I'd like so to see we, the outside move. Yeah, sorry. Then, we yeah. cut back to uh, Cetacean Ops, and we have Tendi using CPR to resuscitate our poor, poor, poor boy more. And it works. Saves his life. Uh, and then Kamolu immediately invites him to go skinny dipping, because <laughs> Kamolu... Um, and Dazed Boimler mentions that he saw a koala, which is a reference to the first season episode where somebody ascends into becoming like a, a godlike energy being. And Why is there a the koala? koala? Yeah. Why it's, is he uh, smiling? <laughs> what does he know? And it's a good ten- self reference. And Tendi, being aware of what's happening, is like, you should just keep that to yourself. <laughs> so, Back we get to, to a nice, scary piece on the bridge where a piece of debris hits the ship. A big piece of debris hits the ship. Yeah. Uh, we see a nice gash in the saucer, though it doesn't look like it really ruptures the inner pressure hull, but it definitely like dents it, kind of like the front of my car. It goes back um, to what Billup says: "We'll take a beating, but we can do it." Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they they like are rattled, and it looks like Mariner is thrust out from the front, which is terrifying. But Jen makes her way out, runs to catch her, grabs her, and pulls her back. Uh, and then there's more debris coming right at them, so it's very short-lived, kind of like celebratory moment. But we did see this cool scene where 
Mariner has her life saved by her ship's nemesis. Mm-hmm. Yep. You never know who's going to save your life. One, one other. I'm full of gripes tonight. I today. I don't know why. You I definitely seem wait. to be. Did you hate this episode, Big J? <laughs> no. I love the episode. It's just they were. I get the whole suspension of disbelief, but there were, in my opinion, so many things that we had to suspend disbelief on that may have kind of been questionable as to how realistic this is. What now, right? BJ? Okay, so now it's the uh, the debris, the piece of debris that hits Ransom's mask or his, his helmet and cracks it. I, I'm not sure how fast they're going, but it was my impression that you don't have to have much speed at all in space for any size object to be mortally no, so dangerous. it's not quite that way. So the thing with space is that everything ends up moving fast if it's in orbit of something long enough. So for example, the ISS, I believe, had a fleck of paint, like a literal fleck of paint. So it has no mass whatsoever, but it made a three inch deep hole into the glass, like the thick glass that they use for viewing out uh, because of the speed it was going at. So speed matters more than, well, speed matters as much as mass, right? But you gotta have one or the other. The little piece that bumped into the glass or whatever it was made out of that that ransom's mask is probably is more reinforced than what's on the iss now the chunk itself definitely wasn't moving as fast as the faint the paint fleck that hit the iss right uh it hadn't had time to be up in orbit it was moving in the same direction generally that they were so mm -hmm. it really wasn't going all that relatively fast i don't know it reminded me more of the scene from into darkness where kirk gets a little piece of rock in his helmet too and i think that also happens to michael burnham at one point too when she's flying around in her suit so like i think it's just a reference to other things but uh yeah not everything in space is going to be serious it's all about like relative speed and mass okay all right i will just shut up big j and just enjoy the episode <laughs> quit nitpicking <laughs> that's what i had to do the first two times <laughs> Some nitpicking is good. I have my nitpick session coming up. Don't you worry. Oh, okay. But, like, but yeah, some nitpicking is just a rule of cool stuff. Like, that was just like, oh, he lost his HUD. Now can he still steer? And now he's yeah. got to actually steer kind of thing. Yeah. So and now he wishes he was sitting in this, the captain's chair. That was exactly. more straightforward. This was exactly. the Occam's razor of, of episodes. Everything that, that, that did go wrong could go wrong. Which Murphy's isn't, Law. Which isn't Murphy's Occam's law. razor. It's Murphy's Law. But, you know, the only way to get a right answer on the internet is to give a wrong one first. It's so true. It okay. is. Yeah. Very true. So, so Archimedes, back to the Archimedes is five minutes. Five minutes to crashing into this planet. And, and here's where we see Sonia Gomez starting to order her crew to the back of the ship. It, there's a greater chance that they'll survive in the back of the ship, maybe. It doesn't seem very likely, but maybe, yeah, infinitesimal. But she's an optimist. Uh, her crew yeah. refuses, of course, to listen to her at all. So they just stay there with their captain. And then we cut to our first scene and see the Leparians uh, not realizing what's going on. But they see some, like, a shooting star in their atmosphere. And people seem excited for it. Which is a terrifying thought, considering it's a flying warp bomb. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, warp core bomb. Uh, we see the Archimedes start to struggle. We see its nacelle being ripped off. And then, out of nowhere... A blue glow of love and friendship envelops it, and it stops its descent. The Care Bear stare saves the day. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just a tractor beam. Same thing, you know. Yep, 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 tractor beam. But why was it suddenly heading straight down to the planet and not spinning like it was? Friction off the atmosphere. Fr yeah, the atmosphere probably straightened it out. That's probably what I, when she said, like, all okay. crew to the back of the ship, they had probably run a projection to figure out what angle they're going to hit. And gone, okay, well, the back of the ship's the safest part from the warp core explosion. Well, it's like the Titanic. Of course, you're going to go to the back of the ship. It'd be the last one to hit the water. Well, the Titanic <sighs> cracked in two, so a little more complicated there, too. There's a little bit of that. It didn't have but a yeah. Titanic this time. Yeah, thankfully, the Cerritos shows up just in the nick of time, saves everyone, the has a tractor beam. The bridge is freaking ruined again. Yes. <laughs> Hey, maybe they'll have another like serious refit next season. The uh, the the Cerritos will look even more badass. Yeah, okay. but but we have to get through this episode first to get through the Cerritos speculation for next season. Cool, cool, cool. All right, mm -hmm. so we have another scene 
where Freeman, Mariner, Ransom, and Shax all beam down to the planet. Uh, they start to introduce themselves to the Lapirian leaders. She is very ner- like Freeman is very nervous. She starts giving this very like rehearsed sounding of like I am Captain Such and Such from the United Federation of Planets, and the Lapirian just interrupts her with a big old bear hug, like a loving bear hug, and then just invites them all out for drinks. So like finally, a party species. Jeez. I need I need to absolutely call out the Jurassic Park reference that's super obvious here. But if you're if you're on, if you're watching this, you can see the alien. They have these fans off the side of their head, and then the yep. two crests. This is a hundred percent a Dilophosaur reference from oh, Jurassic yeah. Park. Like the... mm-hmm. Yeah, the one that spit the yep stuff at Black Newman. Go- goo, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Newman. Newman. Uh, All right, so cut to sick bay, and we've got Tendi, who's being treated for her injuries that they suffered, or having or helping people with their injuries uh, from from the traveling through the debris field. And uh, Tendi gets called into the office of Ta'ana, and Tendi is clearly terrified. And uh, Ta'ana tells her that she's actually not being fired. She's not getting thrown off the Cerritos. In fact, she's recommending her for bridge duty as a science officer, just like uh, Jadzia Dax is what Tendi I don't know says. who the fuck that is. Yeah, <laughs> right. Which like Spock. Response. Yeah, like Spock, <laughs> because she's old and grizzled and awesome. <laughs> Pendy, super stoked, hugs to Anna. To Anna goes, mm, I don't hate this, and then purrs yeah. while hugged. I'm okay that with this. Got me the purring. Yeah. That was That's just the, cool. the icing on the cake. Hilarious. I think it's the happiest we've ever seen to Anna, besides yes. when she's cuddling with Shax. Snuggling Shax, yeah. Uh, I still think okay. that's weird. But. It was a great and, moment. Oh, I loved it. It was really cool. Um, and then the next scene is my background, which is my favorite scene of the episode, because we get to see something we very rarely see. We see a bunch of Starfleet ships working together in a non-combat situation. The only other time I can think of where we really saw this many was after the end of Generations, where you have three ships picking up chunks of the Enterprise crew. Correct. Right? And here yeah. we've got, like, six ships, which is great. Love it. So let's call out what we see. We yep. see this beautiful, nope, this side. Beautiful Parliament class over on this side. We see Cerritos directly above my head over here. Uh, there's a Oberth class over here who's picking up a nacelle from the Archimedes and probably reattaching it soon after. On the far side, we've got another California class. And then here's the real star of our show. This Nova class right here attached yep. to Cerritos. Now, there has been much of speculation about the size of the Cerritos in the California class. Uh, the fan speculation was that it was somewhere around 370 meters or so. Uh, the official word from from the production company and from Mike McMahon was it's 670-ish or so at full size, making it huge. But here's the problem. The Nova class is a ship we know its size. We know exactly how big it is because we've seen it a couple times and we've known its size and it matches. The Nova class is 221 meters. It's right. a significant size compared to the Cerritos in this picture. If it's as big as McMahon says it is, it's not. It just doesn't work. The math here doesn't work out at all. Based on the Scales size of the off. Nova class, yeah, based on the size of the Nova class on this side, uh, it's actually closer to that 360, 370 meter size uh, California class. So yeah. the thing that this does for me is it just tells me that, you know, Star Trek continues to be inconsistent about the scaling of its ships, and I love that because I can just keep ignoring that McMahon says it's 670 meters this way. Yeah, that that is this, and I think that that's something that Star Trek has kind of always done a a good job with is the scale of of things are usually like not quite right. And yeah, I mean we've seen Bird of Prey's between the size of like fifteen meters and like six hundred and fifty <laughs> meters, right? Like yes. we're inconsistent, so you can pick your own, you can pick your head cannon, and my head cannon is justified by this shot here rather than by by like what McMahon says, because I don't think Mike McMahon makes any sense when he says that it's that big. So I'm going to pick my head cannon, and I've picked this one because it's in the episode, and I like it. Yep. Well, it would be nice if they kept things a little more consistent, but... Agreed. You've you've got a... When you said the bird of prey, that that's great. Uh, the it's bird so of prey bad. is the most size-changing ship, I think, in, in all of Star Trek. I think it might be one of the most science-taking ships in all science fiction, to be honest. It has had just yeah. that much variety. What do you think, Dag? You're being real quiet and just, like, licking over here. 
Oh, he's bored of me. I see. I see. That's fair. <laughs> I am not bored of you. I'm realizing that I skipped over my background, which is the mirror of Boimler reaching out when the Titan saved, you know, Cerritos. Now oh, Cerritos yes. saves the Archimedes. Yeah. Yeah. Another good call. But I don't is. disagree. I think it's cool that uh, Cerritos should be smaller. Absolutely. The art people seem yeah. to agree with me that it should be smaller. Go art Mike people. McMahon. <laughs> so everything yeah. is getting back to normal on Cerritos. They're taking care of their wounded. Um, there is the big old hug scene. We go to the sick bay, or we go to the mess hall. It's now happy first contact instead of happy Freeman day. And... Uh, Everybody's kind of chilling there. There's a great first contact reference when Freeman sits at the thing and he's like, "Are you, are you, have you been drinking?" And she's like, "They're a welcoming culture," which is mm -hmm. sort of a mirror of Deanna's line. It's a primitive culture. So You're I love, drunk. No, I I'm love not. that. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, they have some fun laughs. Mariner and Jen figure their stuff out and suddenly become BFFs. Okay. In fact, sure. it's kind of hinted that they might be more than just BFFs. Well, yeah, though that's like totally one of those. Good. One of those so you're saying you like me? What? No, come on. <laughs> no, I mean like there's a legitimate amount of hoye there, right? Like that's an that's a valid question. We know that uh, Mariner. Legitimate amount of what? Hoye. That's. The oh, I thought you word. said legitimate amount of hoeing. Like <laughs> no. <what? laughs> <laughs> no, we know that Mariner plays both fields, which is great. You know, that's, yeah. that's my preferred as well, so I get it. Good, bad but girls. But, like, right, exactly. So it's it's exactly the kind of situation that might be interesting here. Maybe the 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 opposite of hating each other is now they are fuck buddies, and that's, that's healthy, maybe. Okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay. so let's cut to our last significant scene where we have uh, the conference room with the officers... Uh, where Freeman tells them that she intends to stay, um, and they find Commander Mandel, whose name is not said in the episode, but it's in the credits, um, that she tells him that she's going to turn down the transfer to her new ship. She's going to stay. Uh, Mandel says that she doesn't have a choice, and then s she has handcuffs slapped onto her. And then she takes a couple steps out, and... Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, she's being she demands charged. No yeah, she demands to know what she's being charged with, and uh, his response is for the destruction of Pac-Led Planet with a Veruvian bomb and collaborating with Klingon extremists. Um, and then he says something along the lines of, and this happened nine hours ago while you were conveniently on this mission. Like, that's not uh, actually yeah. a valid cover? Uh, uh, like, what? Absolutely what? Yeah, no, these are charges that couldn't stick in a, in a million years. It almost but. makes me wonder if the Klingons set up the Pakleds to do this horrible to do this horrible thing to the Pakleds as like a non-whatever species, but the Federation would care to frame a Federation captain and start some kind of diplomatic incident there. So I think it's one of two things. I think either the Pakleds got that second Veruvian bomb from uh, the, the last Klingon episode, guy. Klingon Kai, Right, and they when they warped out, they took it with them. Then they accidentally blew themselves up, right? They either stupidly blew themselves up, or two, the Klingon High Council, in an effort to like cover up the misdeeds of this Klingon captain, did it themselves. They blew up Pakled Planet in the same way, uh, and then these officers here have somehow misconstrued the evidence to cons to consider like Freeman as being responsible. Like I said, I don't think it's gonna stick. Their 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 ship may have been off, but she has a bridge full of crew uh, that are going to be her alibi. Yeah. And Captain Gon Sonia Gomez is going to be an alibi as well because they saved her life, and she's been here, and they've been too busy doing anything else to, than to right. stripping off for her plates. twenty hours. They've been so, ripping off hull plating. Right. This isn't going to stick. Yeah. It, I it, mean, a, a rookie, you know, a public defender could could get this one. Yeah, I agree. And then we end in a we end with them leaving the, the the actual conference room and going into the hallway where the entire crew is celebrating congratulations to the captain, and they realize the manacles on her wrists. Yep. And then something we haven't seen in a long time in Star Trek to be continued. Yes. Dun, 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 <clears throat> dun, 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 dun. 
dun, 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 dun. <laughs> well, you're bringing back memories Best of, of both the, world memories yeah. Best of both worlds yeah. yeah well but 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 do you know what this means it means the next time we get to hear last time on star trek lower decks oh it's oh. gonna be so cool yes i'm gonna geek out about that oh my gosh <laughs> I'm glad there was a cliffhanger. I think it's sure. Why not? And it's, it's, it's very fitting. It's consistent that the first season is a standalone, and the second season can now have a cliffhanger thanks to Voyager. Voyager mm-hmm. was the only series to have an official cliffhanger in its second season. Uh, TNG had Shades of Grey. Um, DS9 had the Gem Hadar, which did not have a cliffhanger, but still left on that ominous note. Yes. Enterprise did not have a cliffhanger on uh, season two. So. Either way, I thought that it was a yep. great way to end the season. I was very happy. We have one more last exterior shot, which was, again, pretty. It was just that Nova-class ship detaching from Cerritos. You see a little hiss of like air as it detaches, then it leaves, taking Captain Freeman with them. Oh. Weaving the ship yeah. with no captain, which means Ransom is in charge now. Yep. Oh, and Mariner's just going to give him all kinds of hell. So here's his captaincy that he was he was kissing ass. Yeah, that's something that I expect to actually come up in the episode. I wanted to be captain, but not like this. Something along those lines. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that, yeah, that would have... Ex- that's going to be, if anything, it's going to be said in the first episode of season three. Right. Because, so... So if yeah. this show if this show does what the two parters do, Freeman's arrest will be resolved by the end of the next episode. Correct. Yes, yes, agreed. Because that's just what the two parters do, and this has been taking its uh, a huge pull from TNG. All your two part episodes are self sealed. This will be resolved by the end of the next episode. Now, if they decide to take season three and go DS nine with it, then. Or the arrest can resolve any point in the season. Uh, but there's a cool interview out there with Michael Mc, uh, Mike McMahon, if you want to read it, that talks about what next season is looking at. More ships, more beauty, more pack leads. So that is where I'm we are. I'm glad we're getting more pack leads if that's... Well, they're, they're going to be the, the main thread of this thing. So yeah. pack leads are here to stay. How do the Packwoods recover from losing Packwood to Planet? Like, losing Packwood to Planet is a big deal for any culture. Losing your homeworld is a big deal. Oh, well, yeah. What, what's the name of every ship in the Packwood fleet? Packwood ship. What is the name of every ship in the Federation fleet to the Packwoods? Enterprise. Enterprise. What is the name of every planet in the Packwood d- Dominion? I see your point. I get it. However, we saw the queen, king, and emperor of the pack ledge on that one planet. On that planet? Sure. How do we know that that's even their homeworld? Because the captain said it was, and I trust her. Oh, uh, well, but the, the only current. reason that we would have figured homeworld. that out is if the pack ledge had told us. No, they might have been able to decode it. Or it was all a ruse. Woo! <laughs> but yeah, so overall, I, have I thought that the season... I thought this season was... That's how I said, you're, you're a conspiracy correspondent. But yeah, like I thought this season was great. I thought it was uh, very well balanced. I thought that they showed good growth and development in characters. Uh, it gave me some delicious Starship eye candy, which is always welcome. And uh, it wasn't like a big shooting episode, which I think I like. I think I don't want every episode of every season to end with like the end of the universe is at risk here and big space battle that's yeah. kind of crappy space battle. I am with so, you. This was and a really that, great season finale. Four season finales. It, it, it re it it counters Shades of Grey, for me. Oh well, it doesn't take a whole lot to top Shades of Grey. It was a freaking clip show. You're the one who wanted a clip show as the season finale. No, I didn't. Not you. What? No, gag. I was oh, the one okay. who I could said. Tell who you if were pointing it, at on if this. they if they make season two the season two finale a clip show, I'll laugh. Oh, uh, yeah. And technically, we kind of got some clips because of Rutherford's implant deletion. Boo. So, oh, come on. Stop it. Audit chat. Chat pack, back me up here. <laughs> that's a that that's so much of a stretch. It's that's like taffy. Right Whew. there. 
So, <laughs> yeah. What did you think, Big J? Did you like this season? Did you like it this as a finale? Like, what are your thoughts? So, I like this as a finale, yes. I think that the season was superb, but I'll just... I know I've said this just about any time I've been asked this. The first episode of the season just feels like it was like it, it stood out on its own as not to me it just was not a good episode it didn't feel like i was watching a show that had such a solid first season and then from the second episode on to this one it, it just like it made to me it made the first episode even more glaring because everything else was great it's like okay the, to me that first episode just misfired it, it just misfired I, I didn't like it it was kind of boring to me but then everything else was what you expected each each one was was great i really like the uh they're, they're getting more of the serialized tones in the in the show so yes it's episodic but you you still kind of have that season-long thread that's that's just there it's it's not the main part it was like the, the whole season had a B plot and that B plot of the season was the packlets, the, the whole setting up the, the framing of, well, which we know now, the framing of a Starfleet ship. I'm interested to see why, okay, I was about to say why this one. And again, it's like, okay, well, if it wasn't Captain Freeman and the Cerritos, then we wouldn't have the that's the that's the point here is it's just to me it kind of seems like they're going through a lot here to pin it on one ship and one captain yeah we don't know why why it's being pinned on them we don't know if maybe the fact that these shady guys have something to do with rutherford's implants because they have the same voice actor who knows mm -hmm. there there's more to this plot for sure i'm sure we'll find out more and just to counter you just because i know i've said this before I really liked the first episode of season two. I thought it was fantastic. So, different opinions. Yeah. Different opinions exist. That's all. Oh, I yeah. I exist to look for the enjoyment in these episodes. The the speculation and the the detail orientedness and the canon discussions. Those all come after like the fourth viewing. You know, <laughs> like I I really just like to sit down and let these episodes take me where they want to go. And if it's gonna, if it's the, if it means that I'm gonna see a giant floating yoked ransom face biting down on the saucer section of Cerritos, fine, I will take that, because I love Jerry O'Connell, and I want him to keep being on here. Jerry O'Connell, you can <clears throat> slide into my DMs. Yeah. Slider yeah. joke. <laughs> love that. Love All that. This, uh, <laughs> slider. Uh, so, the ASMR. so, I think that, you know, they gave us a ton of stuff to be tantalized for. I thought that they gave us a whole lot of celebrity uh, guest stars on these episodes, which was great. The guy who played the Duke Wars was well known. We had Tom Paris on things. We've had some, we've had a number of voice acting in this season that was very good. So, I'm going to close this times. out with a revelation from the Mike McMahon interview. Mike McMahon says, next season... We're putting the puzzle pieces all together, but you have all the puzzle pieces from this season. Oh. Ooh. Oh, really? Okay. Well, and you, you know what I just thought of kind of going back to the whole, they're, they're doing this huge mastermind plot. Why is it being pinned on the captain of, of the least important ship in the fleet? Kind of reminds me of the the big plot hole of Star Trek Nemesis. Uh, so it's kind of a thing where, yes, you've got this clone of Picard. Yes, it's part of the story. That's the plot. It's great, et cetera, et cetera. But at the time in which this this cloning or or the gathering of the sample from Picard, he was in between ships. This was in between Stargazer and Enterprise. And uh, I believe there's, what, seven or eight years, uh, if, if I recall, in between. So almost it's like, nine. Right, right. Stargazer was so, destroyed at the Battle of Maxia yeah. in 2355. 
Right, right. And probably uh, yeah, had a command right. between the two. We just don't know the details. Maybe multiple commands, honestly. Well, now hold on a second, though. We already know that there's a Romulan Commodore just a couple of years later. She was deep in Starfleet. She totally could have been the one who got that sample in the 2350s. Yeah. Okay. Some Hold Lieutenant on. JG or, or Lieutenant Commander oh. who was serving on the Starbase where they had to debrief him. She'd have access. Come on. I mean, there, were, your, there were Romulan spies like Simon Tarsi's in there, too. So there, who oh, knows? Simon Tarsi's total Romulan spy. <laughs> <laughs> Nora Satai did nothing wrong. <laughs> Nora Satai did nothing wrong. But there's your conspiracy theory for the day. Commander O is the one who stole... Uh, Commodore O is the one who stole Picard's genes and gave them to the Romulans to make shins on. Yeah. Well, and somehow we've managed to do it again as tradition, take a 24-minute episode and turn it into a two-hour review thing. The finale, All right. it's fine. Okay. Well, chat pack and the audience, if you've stuck with us this long, we are truly grateful and humbled by your audience. Stick around, because this might be the last episode of Star Trek lower decks but in just two weeks star trek prodigy comes out and then next month star trek discovery season four in addition to that we have special interviews with noah averback Katz, who played rin in star trek discovery and that second book in the coda series author james swallow sat down with us so look forward to the next two weeks to seeing those episodes as well as always Can't wait thank you for going boldly with Beyond Trek Podcast. <laughs>